Hi there and welcome to Newsnight. I am Ladi Akiri Duluale. Thanks for being with us today. Security challenges and a status report on how the military is doing as far as tackling them is our focus on the program. And my guest thinks a turning point has been reached in winning the battle against the insurgents. My guest also thinks more asymmetrical warfare training and weapons are needed to complete the process, as well as more awareness created about the pros and cons of reintegrating former deviants back into society if they surrender. Newsnight talks to the former director of Army Public Relations, Brigadier General Sani Usman. General Usman, thank you for your time. Welcome to the program. Thank you so much for having me on your program. It appears as if we've reached a turning point of sorts in this long-run battle against uh, insurgents and other types of violent groups. Um, recently, the military authorities have been recording some successes, um, even though there are still challenges. What's the difference between what was happening and what is happening now, do you know? Well, I think I quite agree with you that um, we have reached a turning point or more or less like a watershed in the fight against terrorism and insurgency in the country. You know, 12 years is quite a long time. But it's not surprising also, uh, given the resilience of the Nigerian military and of course the concerted efforts being uh, uh, made over time. Therefore, the results that we are seeing now are not surprising. I'm talking about where you have a massive surrender of the Boko Haram terrorists and uh, the successes being recorded, you know, in the northeast, especially in the northern part of Borno and the fringes of, uh, uh, you know, Lake Chad uh, region. So, invariably, it is a... Uh, a combination of so many factors that brought about these successes that we are witnessing and uh, the other issues that we have been experiencing. Take, for instance, the issue of the massive surrender. I think what is most important now uh, thing to do is to also rise up to the occasion because this is something that is coming uh, more or less like well, uh, do I call it a pleasant surprise, even though we know that it is going to happen? But you know, over time, there are conventional ways of uh, dealing with issue of, uh, you know, disarmament, demobilization, uh, rehabilitation, re uh, reconciliation, and reintegration. And now we are left with a uh, kind of no on limited time, just like what happened in Afghanistan, you know, the sudden taken over of the country by the Taliban, you know, so uh, the, the policy seems to be ill-prepared for it. But uh, that notwithstanding, I think it's just the issue of uh, taking the people along in the sense that uh, there are issues of uh, justice, there, is a, there are issues of responsibility, there are issues of rehabilitation, integration, you know, and reconciliation within the society, and it cannot be done overnight. It's a process that takes time. But now we have that. But unfortunately, the strategic communication, there seems to be a missing link in the sense that uh, every Nigerian ought to have been taken on board so that everybody will have an understanding. Remember, there are people that are direct victims, but invariably the Nigerian society is also a victim of this insurgency and terrorism because there is no facet or component of Nigerian society that has not been negatively impacted with this. People's lives were lost, precious lives, businesses were disrupted, structures, and if you look at those towns or those areas that seems to contribute massively to, you know, uh, full security of this country. You, you talk of Burma, you talk of Mongono, Baga, and the rest of them. You just work out all the infrastructures have been destroyed to the extent even electric pole was destroyed. Right. Talkless of other businesses, you know, filling station, farms, schools, so on and so forth. And people lost their parents, lost their spouses, lost their children. And today you are talking about you know, forgiveness, 
integration and all the rest, it's, it's very difficult for an average human being to take it all at once. Therefore, there should be massive, you know, uh, kind of, uh, you know, uh, constructive engagement of the people so that they see the need that definitely we cannot go kinetic all the way. Now that non-kinetic aspect is paying dividends, how do we integrate that into the Nigerian society? You have to talk about justice, justice for the victims, justice for even the perpetrators of the crimes. Remember, it is not everybody that is in Boko Haram that deliberately entered Boko Haram. Because in those days, the Kacho town, they coerce people into it. So the level of participation in their nefarious activities varies from one individual to another. Therefore, there should be a clear cut a system or process that will distinguish between those that committed heinous crime and those that were coerced and they have not. And uh, again, you talk about uh, the radicalizing them because this we are dealing with an ingrained ideology that has been put in place over time. You know, you, you will not understand till when you have met any one of them, especially the hardcore, uh, it is very difficult, you know, to just overnight assume that people will, will just change overnight. There must be a process of, you know, removing of removing that idea from their head. So uh, it's, it's a long term uh, process that needs to be followed stage by stage, all encompassing. Talking about, you know, the justice, the the the. the System, you know, the, uh, the radicalization, and of course, think of uh, you know training for them to do, uh, you know, something that will hold them because some of them, they have lost everything. How do you integrate them into the society? Even though they are not hardcore Boko Haram, what vocation will they be involved in? And in most cases, some of them, they have also lost their family. How do you psychologically, you know, uh, you know, support them? So these are issues that we really need to. And uh, thankfully, I think uh, those concerned, they are making concerted efforts to see that uh, these issues are addressed. But we need to address them so that we will not have a occurrence maybe in 10, 20, or 30 years to come. The other part of this, of course, is that uh, people are asking the question that when the military forces get hold of these people, either they surrender or they are captured, um, do they have the capacity, do you think, to be able to make the separation that you've just talked about? That is, those who are in the hardcore, uh, those who joined Boko Haram uh, unwillingly because circumstances created uh, the need or the opportunity for them to join, and then those who are simply victims in Boko Haram. That is, those, for example, those women who married Boko Haram commanders. Who are forced into who, who marriage. Who are forced into marriage with Boko Haram commanders after being kidnapped. Now, when such a settlement is overrun, people will say, okay, all of you here are Boko Haram. So, they treat you all the same way. Now, do you think the military forces have the wherewithal to be able to make this separation? So that, at the end of the day, we don't have hardcore people you know, undergoing supposed derogulations. I'm not preempting you. What, right. what do I, and that is the mistake we kept on making over time. You know, giving, I mean, lumping everything on the doorstep, uh, doorstep of the military, uh, in particular all the security forces in general. When you are faced with this kind of security challenge, terrorism and insurgency, if you are putting it on 100%, you know, the military effort is uh, more or less insignificant as compared to other, you know, efforts by other components of the society. So the kinetic aspect of it, boots on the ground, is about uh, 30, uh, 35 to 40 percent at most. So it is not the military per se. It, there must be a grand strategic direction, you know, holistically involving other components of the Nigerian society. You should look at the, you know, the national security strategy. It has allocated roles and responsibilities to various, 
you know, components of Nigerian society. The military should be allowed to fight the war. Their own essence is to defeat the adversary, bring them to certain level of disintegration and, you know, you know, defeating them so that you can make room for humanitarian activities, law and order and governance to take place. So that is it. So other aspect, yes, the military has been doing marvelously well because they have what you, it is not just the military, the intelligence and security forces, they have the joint uh, intelligence brew, even before the massive surrender in which they sort out the categories of this thing. Uh, this this uh, terrorists or those who have been involved in terrorism and insurgency over the years. Now, when you are talking about that, you have to also reflect back. Times have changed. There is a new level of consciousness. Initially, the military had always been denigrated, championed by so-called those some of those so-called people concerned about human rights and all the rest, they painted a very gory and nasty picture of the military. And the military had to go out of their way to show the world that they are really being professional. They are, you know, abiding by international humanitarian role despite the prevailing circumstances they found themselves where you cannot even distinguish the enemy unless if you see him or her with weapon or IED because they melt with the society. So it was a difficult thing, you know, like fighting in built up areas. Right. So, but over time, this image has changed. And, you know, people have realized the truth that they are doing the best they could in the circumstances they found themselves. And where people are found culpable, they are decisively dealt with. Now, I believe even up to this moment, there is still a sitting court martial in the Northeast dealing with, you know, Officers and soldiers that have been involved is one misdemeanor or the other or human rights abuses and to the point that some of them were even sentenced to death. So these people now realize that actually the military have been doing a marvelous job facing the enemy at the same time trying so hard to maintain professionalism abiding by the law. We need to continue to support the military. You know, now that we are faced with this, there should be a synergy between the three tiers of government, especially in the Northeast. The federal government has to come in and the state government have to come in. And of course, they cascade this issue to the local government and what level, because at the end of the day, these are the people that have been the victims these are the people that you are, you know, sending these people back to the society. Uh, we have had instances where nations were faced with conflicts just nearby here. Look at what happened uh, in Sierra Leone, late 90s, early, you know, 2000s. 2000s. Liberia. Yeah, Liberia. And just quite recently too, Rwanda. You know, they have a system, a justice system, you know, reconciliation system to the point now that is seen as a model. Well, thankfully, I had the theater commander operation, Hadenkai, was talking about the Maidugurui uh, model. And I think it's a kind of hybrid or combination of what we have had, you know, given the international best practice and the realism of the Nigerian context or the Nigerian society, particularly the Northeast. So it is not just about the capacity of the military, you know, dealing with it, but also the government itself, to what extent they have the infrastructure, uh, you know, the processes, the expertise, you know, to sip out. And I must say that this process, we have to be very, very careful. Because it is not just that they are tired of fighting, it is because of combination of so many factors, particularly the onslaught, uh, you know, of their various location by the military that they had no choice other than to surrender. So that does not remove that ideological, uh, you know, beliefs from their minds. From their minds. So you, you, you have to come out with a system 
to remove that. And apart from that, also the issue of those that were involved in him, crimes against humanity. You know, they, people have started talking, particularly those of them in Goda, they have identified people that have committed heinous crime against them. You know, people that led attacks to Goza, Bama, and all the rest, you know, burning, killing people, and now you are telling us that we should embrace, embrace them wholeheartedly. Even though the justice system is very difficult, and I know that is where the, they had a problem with uh, the other GIWA project, because it is very difficult about getting, the, you know, the Evidence Act and all the rest of the thing, but somehow, people that are involved, uh, we should find a way, those that have committed crimes against humanity, the justice system should take care of them. And those that are not culpable, we should find a better way of rehabilitating them, you know, teaching them skills before we think of reconciliation and integrating them into the society. That brings me to two things. Uh, the first is that people have said, uh, and some of the people who said this, are both in and outside of the military, that the issue of boots on ground, the army or the armed forces going, they take uh, uh, an area which had uh, insurgents of different types in control before. They take the area, but because other areas are there to be uh, gotten at, they've got to move. Now, what happens to that area after they leave? Ordinarily, in more organized systems, the police then moves in once order has been reestablished to keep maintaining. That has not been the case in Nigeria. So quite a number of people say maybe there needs to be more people in the army because as Boko Haram is being fought in the Northeast, the, the same army is fighting people in the Northwest. The army is fighting people in the North Central. The army is fighting people in the Niger Delta. It's, it's in defense forces uh, in, in the South-South. It's in, in the Southwest. So, and yet, its basic function is territorial integrity. So you still got to keep some people back to be doing that, even while you are doing this. And some of you in the army, those who have been in it recently, those who have been in it in the past, and those who are in it now, keep saying, if you want all this to happen, then we need to be more. There need to be more people, there need to be more weapons, there needs to be more money overall to run this. Do you, are, you, are you an advocate of that? Well, beyond that, um, naturally when you are faced with security challenges, um, uh, you devise means of dealing with it, uh, given the context you found yourself. And um, there is no gain saying of the fact that um, you need to have appreciable human resources and equipment that will deal with that. More, or, more so now, you know, the challenges that we are having, they are unlike the challenges we have in the past, you know, interstate conflicts, but now they are intra. You have non-state actors that you are dealing with, and some of whom are even the citizens of this country. Now, the more you have, and you know, the, the key to it is uh, information and intelligence gathering. And that is where the human resources come into play. And of course, the kinetic aspect. So it is not just the armed forces or the military itself, the, but the totality of the security architecture. When we had the unfortunate civil war, there was massive recruitment to deal with the issue. And thereafter, there was demobilization, even though it has its own social effect. And I think it is not out of place if we have more number uh, you know, of uh, you know, security personnel. So it is not restricted to the armed forces alone, but including other aspects of the security structure. Now, let's even look at it. The UN, uh, what is the UN ratio of an average police uh, you know, to, to a number of people? I think it's just about 400. Yes, one to 400. But what is the number obtainable now? The total strength of the Nigerian police force in this country cannot be up to 400. I believe it's just about 300 and something, uh, 307 something thousand. Now, that we are 300, told one third of those ones. Exactly. That 307 something thousand, how many of them are truly performing policing duties? So you need to have a sporting structure before you even call in the military. Now, the, the, the police in those days, beyond the, the, the criminal investigation and what have you and so on and so forth, you know, you know they try to detect crimes 
and prevent them. But now we are more or less reacting because the numbers are not there. To what extent have we invested in our policing system within the last 20 years? I believe it's negligible. And bulk of the security challenges stem from the fact that we neglected our policing system. And that is why there is no single country in this world that does not have police. But there are countries without armed forces. Therefore, it is not just the number of the armed forces. We should also think of policing system. It might not necessarily also, when I talk about policing system, just the Nigerian police force as you know it. But there are other security agencies that perform policing duties, duties also. Right. You know, the paramilitary. Take, forces, for instance, yes. the civil defense and others. To what extent? What is the number? What is their equipment? What is their training? These are the issues that you have to take into consideration, even if we are living in an ideal, peaceful society. But we are not. We are faced with so many security challenges. To what extent have we taken advantage of this God-given resource, the human resource? Because the strength of Nigeria lies on its human resource, beyond the other natural uh, resources that God has given us. To what extent have we effectively utilized it? Look at the issue of community policy. Now we are talking about vigilantes and all the rest of the thing. So it's, it's, it's a kind of holistic thing that we need to, you know, increase the number of all the security architecture in the country and emphasize on modern and effective training and equipping too. Right. Now... Uh some have also suggested that maybe if we look at the cost of increasing the strength, that is the human numbers in the military, paramilitary, the police and so on, and the cost of equipping them and all of that, that it might be cheaper in the long run to simply bring in mercenaries like we did in 2014 uh, in the Northeast. Uh, these are organizations of professionally paid uh, soldiers, uh, but who the difference are that they are not fighting in the Nigerian army, they are fighting on behalf of the country for which they get paid. Um, and they are given a target for which they are to be paid. So if we bring in those and we say, okay, you, this group, tackle this, you, this group, tackle that, that in the long run, it might be cheaper and it might be more sustainable at the end, provided they meet the target, that after they've done that, they go away. And then the regular forces, both the military and the police, take over the areas where they have done the work. Now, you've been in the military, you've been out. So I'm sure you have had a good idea of what these people are like, um, both within the service and outside. And you've had the experience because you were in the army when they were brought here in 2013, 2014, uh, to the Northeast, many people said they did very well, and that problem started it, it, after they left. It may interest you Let to know you that um, I was also at the theater, 2014 to 2015. So right. uh, I also fought the war. So I know what it is. But uh, if you are talking about the cost implication, what if you invest the same resources into the Nigerian uh, security architecture. Will it not be better in the long run? And now, let's also look at it this way. I believe, even though we need support from well-meaning nations, you know, in terms of selling equipment, intelligence, and what have you, but I think to a large extent, the solution to Nigerian security challenges lies within. First and foremost, there should be, you know, the determination and greater sense of purpose. And I can give you an example. Way back, mid 2014, not 2015, uh, Nobody was so sure that Nigeria would survive because the Boko Haram terrorists have even had the effrontery to declare some part of Nigerian territory 
as part of their caliphates and what have you. And uh, there was a renewed effort which was brought about by a new leadership of the country and the leadership of the armed forces. And I know between July 13, 2015, to let's say December 2016, how many numbers of soldiers were recruited? What are the equipment, you know, that were brought in? Were able to recapture all held territories by the Boko Haram terrorists? Who did it? They were the same Nigerians. Remember again, period to that July, Nigerian soldiers were even abandoning locations to the point that they even ran away to a neighboring country. You remember the, the yes. euphemism of tactical withdrawal and what have you. Yes. The same group of soldiers that were running were turned into fighting machines. They were turned into fighting machines. Was it spirit that turned them? No. Our fellow Nigerian military officers, given the desired leadership, they had the focus, they have the support of the Nigerian government and the Nigerian society, and they did what they did, and we are even ripping it, we are taking it every day a notch higher. So we have to believe in ourselves. We have the capacity, we have the means to do that. All it requires is to have a greater sense of direction and focus and ensure the security forces are given what they require and there should be an effective monitored and evaluation system. Every Nigerian should have a sense of belonging, not a situation, even among the northern people, that sometimes back and to some extent, you know, they, among the northerners, they will think it's a northeast problem. And even in the northeast, they will say, no, it's Borno problem. And even in the Borno problem, they will say it's Kanuri problem. No, it's a Nigerian problem. And it should be seen as such and treated as such. That means whatever we are doing should involve the whole components of Nigerian society. Let there be a holistic approach. Everybody has a role to play. Even if it is kind word, talkless or prayer. But you have a situation whereby people are pulling in various directions. People are supporting and assisting these terrorists, sometimes ignorantly, sometimes for, simple, for the simple reason because they thought they are not involved. Where do they get their information? Where do they get their logistic supply? And look, if there is a massive arms purchased by the Boko Haram terrorists, you will know it through the Jens publication. So the whole idea is beyond the military, the other people that are statutory responsible, charged with the responsibility of supporting the military, should do what is expected of them. And of course, the Nigerian society should be galvanized to continue to support the armed forces and the security forces. I can rest assure you, we can decisively deal with these security challenges. We don't even need the mercenaries you are talking about. We have seen it, those that brought the mercenaries. And we have seen what happened to the Afghans. So the solution to Nigerian security challenges lies with the Nigerian people. But I must, I must at this point also ask that if, I mean, taking the fact that yes, the Nigerian military is capable, yes, we do not, uh, 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 in your view, need uh, any foreign soldiers, let me put it that way. But as things stand now, the security challenges have multiplied. You know, earlier I mentioned the fact that, okay, you had Boko Haram in the Northeast, which was what everybody was faced with. But now we have moved on to kidnapping, illegal mining, cattle rustling, banditry, banditry you name it. There's quite a bit happening now. Yeah. And in each of these theaters, what is required is different uh, as a response. 
And I know that some of your colleagues, even you, have said it is unfair to expect that the Nigerian military can respond to all these things without adequate training, without a, a deep understanding of what it is it is going to face in those places. And sometimes the result has been some of the things we have seen happen initially when the military was sent to those places. Uh, I, I wonder now if you think that perhaps it was a, it was, it was a mistake to quickly just grab hold of the Nigerian military and send them into those places without a deeper understanding of what was going on there. I'll give you two examples. For example, in the case of Zamfara, it has since come to light that there were two things happening in Zamfara. There was the illegal mining, which was being covered by the whole issue of banditry. There were a lot of people doing illegal mining, including foreigners. Then, in the case of Kaduna, people who had been pushed out of Borno and other outlying areas in terms of the insurgency when they found the place a bit too hot, moved into these other places. Again, what they were now doing in these other places was not a straightforward them versus the military. They were now going after the civilians. Vulnerable groups, I believe the uh, people in, in the armed forces call them. Today, was it with benefit of hindsight perhaps not the right decision to have sent in the military there? Well, um, the first and foremost, what I want you to understand is that um, you know, their situation require drastic actions. You know, when you are faced with fire incident, sometimes you don't discriminate the type of water you use to quench the fire. The most important thing is to quench the fire thereafter you determine. So even water from the water can be used to do that. And uh, you see the problem is that we have this um, fire brigade approach to, you know, complete resolution a knee-jack response to issues. Uh, you know, we rather react rather than being proactive. Now, actually you can trace to some of the security challenges way back to maybe 20, 20 something years back because we have had history of uh, military intervention in the political governance of this country. But luckily, way back 1998, 1999, Nigeria resolved to go into democracy. And thankfully, we are waxing stronger. But you should understand, democratic governance is entirely different with military governance. What were the existing structure as of 1999, and what was the envisaged, you know, structures that need to be in place, you know, to support and sustain democratic governance. Knowing fully well bureaucracy is involved, everybody is a partaker in, you know, the running of the country as against dictatorship. Now, we felt to strengthen or rather establish and strengthen institutions that are capable of supporting democratic governance. To what extent have we invested in the security architecture, the judiciary, and social investment programs, as well as economy of the Nigerian society, so that Nigerians can aspire to be wherever they want to without, you know, going into complex and resorting to self power. This is what we are ripping up now. Now, there is no better financier to security challenges than good governance. But of course, the situation is so there, people are dying, you know, they have been recycling villages, kidnapping women and children, raping them, killing them. You cannot fold your arms. So you think of solutions. We have wasted precious time covering up just like you mentioned. Illegal mine was going on. People turned a blind eye. Thankfully, 
there, you know, when there were security challenges in Nasarawa, the special forces were called in and they decisively dealt with it. And that is what should have been done a long time ago. You know, with the security challenge before they come up, you know, to become the monster they are today. Now, if you look at the Northwest, for instance, Kaduna, Kanu, uh, no, Kaduna, Katsina, Zamfara, to a large extent, Niger State, Sokoto, Kebi, they are faced with similar security challenges. You know, the state governors were moving in different directions. Some were thinking of negotiation with the bandits. Others were saying, no, we should fight them till they succumb. Now, there should have synergy of effort. Now, they have come back, thankfully. They are imposing uniform strategies that are working. Even though there are, you know, noted observations that need to be dealt with, but I think the most important thing is to acknowledge the fact that we are faced with problems and no single individual can do it alone. We need to synergize, not just among the security forces, but those in a position of authority so that there will be a holistic approach to it. Because these people will simply migrate to another area. To another area. Therefore, while the armed forces or the security forces are doing what they are doing, you galvanize the society, you know, giving credible and timely information and imposing these stringent measures, you know, burning telephone, you know, cell or patrol and all the rest of them. You can imagine a bandit has the effrontery to challenge the authority of a state governor that people should protest those measures, that he is on authority up to himself, simply because they allow them. And we should not have double standard. A criminal is a criminal. And we know that bulk of these things, we have been fed false information about them, that they think they have local standing of what they are doing. And I tend to disagree, because I cannot imagine how raping of a woman will help your cause, or killing old people and children, or destroying people's livelihood. I came from a village, so I know that it is the normal criminal that were stealing goat and chicken, that they have grown up to cattle rustling, and now AK-47 has made the difference. And we have been condoning it over time. There should be improved justice system, but especially the criminal justice system, that people that are involved in criminality are held, I mean, accountable so that it will serve as deterrence, so that it will give people a sense of belongings, particularly the victims, that they have confidence that even you, with all your material well-being, that if you trample on Nigerians' rights, the courts will be there for them. Indeed. I so must, basically, these are the issues. I, I, I must ask you at the point at which you reach, though, um, you, and because you've talked about it two or three times in your various answers, the importance of galvanizing the civilian population and, uh, and other such elements in, in the society to support uh, the armed forces. In your previous role as a, a spokesperson, I want you to look at this. Um, most of the time, when civilians come across the military, even without the military doing anything, there is a certain level of fear, apprehension anxiety and then that is made worse when the military itself having not been used to civilian military relations act in a way that even makes them more scared so when you say oh please feel free to come and give us information um, there will be those who say i should go to barack and go and give information. No, um, I, I don't think that one is going to be possible. People in your role have tried to give the military a more humane face. How do you think that is going with the experience you had and what is happening today? Um, is, is the relationship better or do you think people are still very scared of the military? That will require an in-depth research. <laughs> Uh, honestly, I don't well, have an. Uh, yeah, I think to me, I think there is an improved relationship, despite the fact that um, 
the security challenges actually are not uh, helping matters at all. But of course, you should understand, again, we still have to go back to what I said earlier on in respect of, uh, you know, building institutions and, uh, you know, having, you know, a credible and effective security architecture. Take, for instance, before you think of deploying the military, you, you think of all the components of the security architecture. Take, for instance, the police, you know, and if it is beyond that, you have the mobile police force. Then, of course, the military, there are timelines, you know, the entry and exit strategy, then hand over, you know, to, back to the police when, uh, you know, the semblance of law and order has been, you know, uh, restored. So, unfortunately, we are living in very interesting times. That is not the case. And, uh, you know, at every instance, the military are always there. And, of course, it brings about, you know, the sore relationship between the military and uh, the civilian populace. But I know that the military over time have been doing the best they can. Uh, you know, I have told you about the image of the military, you know, aggravated by allegations of human rights abuse and all the rest. But eventually, they have uh, ro uh, risen to the occasion, to the extent that beyond the public relations and information department of the armed forces and even at the defense headquarters, now they have gone a notch higher to establish a Department of Civil Military Affairs. You know, army started, or, and remember, one interesting thing people hardly know was that uh, way back 1999, there was a kind of 15-year plan, you know, you know, kind of reorienting the armed forces to the reality of, you know, democratic governance. You know, I could remember the honored uh, Office of uh, uh, Transformation and uh, Innovation, eventually Transformation and Innovation, Honor Transformation. You know, 15, you know, dealing with not just uh, attitudinal change, but also equipping and, you know, uh, other things. How do you envisage the armed forces in 10, 15 years' time? I think it ended in uh, 2015. But then the thing is that you cannot reorient in isolation of the Nigerian society. So much as the military was orienting itself to realities of the time, the Nigerian society ought to have also been oriented to the fact that this is democracy, things take time. There are also channels of, you know, secret redress and all the rest, not that you, 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 you know, take advantage or take law into your hand. And those people that are in position of authority, they are alive to their responsibilities. You eschew unprofessional and corrupt practices. Now, moving forward, you know, the Department of Civil Military Affairs, you know, has been interfacing. Now they have even established a kind of defense liaison office, not just in the National Assembly, but they have in the Minister of Foreign Affairs. And the level of uh, synergy of effort in terms of training, you know, seminars, you know, at the various training institutions, particularly the Armed Forces Command and Staff College, the National Defense College, and the various war colleges of the institution, I mean, of the services. Now they take in students from sister security agencies and even, you know, public service. So there is an understanding, synergy of effort, and that is why now you have an understanding, uh, you know, among the people in position of authority. Beyond that, again, I think it was the Nigerian army that first came out with a public, for, you know, toll-free line, 193. You know, we had a call center that from wherever you are in this country, if you dial it I, now, it will ring. Somebody will pick and will listen to you and will direct your complaint. So you don't need to go to the barracks. Then, of course, there is establishment of human rights decks, you know, in which you can physically go and complain. Because of the apprehension, it was discharged from the military barracks. I know in Abuja, it's somewhere around Area 11, and you have well-trained courteous officers and soldiers that will listen to you and direct or solve the problem, some of whom are even lawyers, you know. So, 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 so things are getting better with each passing day. So the media should also enlighten the public, the efforts of the armed forces, you know, to ensure that they take on the public, not to talk about the fact that uh, all their internal security operations, they go hand in glove with 
you know, uh, humanitarian activities, you know, it, be it quick impact projects that intervene in either healthcare delivery system, education, Outreach other programs, infra indeed. exactly. You understand, uh, constructing roads or rehabilitating schools or boreholes and so on and so forth. So these are the efforts of the military that, you know, uh, you know, giving the society a kind of sense of belonging open and up, and which needs to be understood, which needs to be appreciated, and possibly maybe they should also have budgetary allocation, you know, for humanitarian activities as part of military operations, you know, to enhance the winning of the hearts and minds of the people. Uh, but they require the support of the people and understanding of the people to succeed. Nigeria is 61. Um... And people have said, as you pointed out, we've been fighting internally since 2009. Looking forward now, uh, I have two sub-questions. The first is, do you think we will win this war? That's number one. And number two, do you have hope that if you think we will win, that following that, the country will be much stronger. I'm absolutely positive. Therefore, the short and the longest answer to both questions is yes. And um, this stems from the fact that over time, Nigeria has been through worse circumstances and we came out better off for it. And I know Nigerians are learning lessons, and they are more, more enlightened and realizing the fact that we need each other. Forget about all the talks here and there, but the truth is that everybody, majority rather, I would say, prepare a strong and united Nigeria. And I believe the good people of this country will do all that it takes to ensure the sustenance of peace, security, and unity of this nation. The average Nigerian person is a good person. I can rest assure you, all he or she require is the right leadership and sincerity of purpose by those people in authority and you get the best out of it. And I am sure our leadership recruitment system is getting better and better. And Nigerians are conscious of what they want from their leaders, I believe, as time goes on, they will up the, you know, the, the, the requirement of an average leader at any given time. So we'll continue to have the best and Nigeria will be better off for it. And going back to the issue of war, I don't know which war you are talking, but I believe you are referring to the mirrors of the security challenge. Indeed, that's what I'm referring to. Yes, that's correct. That's right. and all the rest. Right. Now, I have made reference to the synergy now, the renewed understanding by the state governments, and of course we need more synergy, more understanding, more coordination and cooperation between the three tiers of the government, the federal, state, and the local government system. We have to be realistic that if the local government system is not working, the states will continue to suffer and the federal government will continue to suffer and Nigeria will be worse off for it. So the earlier we resuscitated our local government system, let it be viable. Not that they will be just there to share allocation and they are broke over the weekend and just to issue indigency letter. No. They should be allowed to function optimally so that they can be able to cushion some of these challenges that we are having. And I can rest assured Nigeria will be better. There are so many things to be done to ensure that Nigeria, uh, you know, remain one indivisible country, united, peace, and prosperous. But I am optimistic, and I am not alone. There are so many millions of other Nigerians that are of the same view, and all we need to do is to continue to pray and do the right thing so that we have a wonderful country. General Usman, thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much for being with us. It's a pleasure. That's Newsnight. Thanks for watching. We do enjoy hearing from you about this conversation and much more. Our social media handles are on your screen. You can also listen to this and previous episodes of the program via our podcast. Please go to channelstv.com forward slash podcast. 
I am Ladi Akiri Duluale. Goodbye. <laughs>